Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Zone Star State Podcast. I'm Matthew Bruni, and joining me once again is Ishmael Johnson. And today, Ish, we are joined by Ronald Huey, the head coach of Houston Women's Basketball. Coach, how are you doing today? Pretty good, guys. Pretty good. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I love doing these uh, type of Zooms and podcasts and things like that just because it's so informative. Um, I have an opportunity to go back and listen to them and, and watch you guys as you go further and talk to other coaches. Um, really exciting. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, talked to uh, the Rice head coach uh, last week. You know, we've talked to Karen Aston, Jason Burton from North Texas, all that stuff. So, uh, yeah, you can just get the get the scouting scouting reports. Uh, when you watch those nice little 25 minute clips. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, I want to start with last year. Um, obviously, we, we mentioned it even before we started. We, we pressed record. Um, man, what a year it was, uh, just going through the ups and downs, but obviously 15 and 16 overall, but 10 and five in conference, you make a run to the American championship game. Uh, we'll, we'll get into this more, but it definitely felt like y'all found y'all's identity, um, as the year went on and it was a really fun team for us to watch. So we wanted to have you on for sure. Exactly. You know, starting out, you have really, really high aspirations and, we just didn't start well. We didn't start out shooting the ball well. And that was something that um, we wasn't used to. You know, I mean, every year we always play, you know, somebody tough, Oklahoma or Georgia Tech or at Cal or something like that. And we always shot the ball well um, because we knew defense is going to have opportunity to show up each and every time we step on the floor. And um, it was just just Achilles heel for us at the beginning of the season. We just couldn't understand why. And, as we started to go a little bit, we started to get into some rhythm. Then we started um, to apply ourselves and, and start leading all these games. You know, we, you know, we led the Rice game three quarters of the way, you know, the last five minutes, last four minutes, you know, something like that. Uh, we led the, the um, Florida game down there in the tournament, you know, all the way in, lost in overtime. You know, Florida State game at home, led all the way and lost in overtime. Um, there's just so many games like that that was really, really crushing. But then everybody go home for Christmas, and I don't know what happened. They came back, and they just woo-saw, and, you know, we started to put things together, you know. And that's why the, the resilience of this team has just always been really, really great because, you know, the toughness, because we say the toughest team wins, is always going to be there. You just got to do the, the necessary things to ensure winning and that's eliminate mistakes down the stretch. But the run to the championship game was incredible. You know, just having all those girls just on the same page and we started to really gel. And, you know, the one thing is it's kind of like what Dion said, you know, this past weekend, you know, you believe. And they started to believe in conference and they believed that we could get there and then just couldn't finish the job. But we got there and did a heck of a job getting there through all the ups and downs that we had during the season because that's what the season is. It's a grind. Yeah, I'm wondering, you know, as you guys are going through kind of the rough start, is that something like, do you think that's coachable or is that something that you're just kind of sticking with it? You know, because you got you mentioned that you're leading and then it just kind of falls away. Is that a mental thing or are you looking for like, can I change things as a coach to maybe help them out late in games or things like that? And, you know, it's something my high school coach, his name is Tim Gates, and um, he was practically my dad. Um, so he helped me through all of these years. And the one thing he said – at the end of games, you do not play anymore. The mm -hmm. players have to make plays and win games. Yeah. You can try your best to put them in whatever positions, but everybody is scouted. So players make plays, players win games. So don't you ever forget that. Coaches lose games. Players mm -hmm. win games. And he said, your players, at the end, they have to win games. So to answer your question, I think we didn't have enough of uh, playing – against each other or our practice guys or whatever in those situations. And that was on me um, throughout some of the um, preparation for those games, because again, we always think with our defense and how we turn it up and those things that we're going to always be in the lead and be able to push people and, and not blow them out, but be able to have a comfort lead where we can win. And those things wouldn't happen down the stretch because the offense was hurting us. We'll get three kills in a row and then don't get any points out of those stops, three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back stops, and then they don't get in the points, and then it demoralizes your team. So that's where 
I need to try to figure some things out. But then I had to give them a little bit more freedom to be able to play through some things on the floor. And then also trying to find the right combination um, the last four minutes of games. Um, I had all kind of coaches calling me. You need to script the four plays, five plays that you're going to run. The other ones need to be like, you don't need to have set plays. You just need to let them play. So, I mean, it's mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And then you finally get to a rhythm where, okay, I'm good with this group. They're going to be able to perform these sets. I'm going to give them this leeway and transition. Um, and then we can be able to see what happens. And, and those things start to happen for us. Yeah, I, I was curious um, in general. Obviously, you know, you pride yourself on defense. Uh, last year's team, especially being the defensive type of team that it was, where, I mean, you go through the stats, y'all are, I think it's, you know, 23rd in effective field goal percentage defense. Uh, and then obviously from an offensive rebound perspective, too, uh, y'all were very highly rated. So, did that kind of grit and toughness, did you, at what point did the team kind of fully, you think, embrace that, like, we're not letting teams score? And then, I think you are second in the country in steals too. It's like just all mm -hmm. over the place. Uh, how how did that evolution kind of come as the season went on? I think we had a heart to heart right before Christmas, and um, I think once they got back, they kind of said, "Okay, let's buy in and do what coach is asking us to do." Mm -hmm. um, because what we do is very hard. You know, you can easily go to schools that can play pack line, that's going to play two three zone that's going to even do some zone pressing, 2, two one, you know, that kind of stuff, fall back into this. But to pick up 94 feet every single time, to run and jump and guard every single time, to get in the half court and up the line, on the line, don't allow people to catch the basketball, to keep the ball on one side of the floor, to pressure it every single time, like that's hard. And so you have to have an all-invested, all-committed team to be able to do that. And I think when they went home for Christmas, they kind of got the mindset. I don't know if they said it among themselves, but we came back. We saw a different group that was ready to embrace everything we was asking them to do. Because, you know, as players, they could say all this, but they got to play me. You know, they got to play me for this. They got to play me for that. And so when well, you don't have quite enough depth, to be able to sit the ones down for not doing what you ask them to do, they kind of put you in the pickle. Hmm. But it, it really got us to a point, you know, we were number one in three-point field goal percentage defense. We were number one in mid-range defense, held people to 22%. Uh, we were number one, like you said, number two, I'm sorry, in forced turnovers. We forced 24 a game. You know, we were number two in the country. Um, it's just so many different things on the defensive end where we were locked in, but – offensively we still needed to get there and we need them to share the basketball and, and do some things necessary to be successful on that end. Yeah, I was going to, I'm glad you guys started talking about the defense. Cause I was going to wonder, is there something in the water in Houston that kind of makes defense, whether it's the men's or the women's side, kind of the calling <laughs> card of the team? <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, Houston is a, <clears throat> is a melting pot of a city that has a little bit of everything. And once you get here, it just climbs on you and you carried around every day. Um, mm -hmm. Coach Sampson was already defensive minded. I already wanted to develop the defense like I, uh, like we're doing right now. And I think this kind of jailed that way. They it's so great because they do it a different way than we do it. Sure. You know, you don't press. You pick up point right over half, just right over half court. And you know they're just really, really tough. They don't give up paint points and that kind of stuff. And like I told him in women's basketball, everybody can't dribble. So. Mm -hmm. Everybody can't do that. So we have to be able to put pressure on them. But they can run a lot of set plays now. They can run a lot of set plays. So you have to take them out of those sets and things like that. And on the men's side, talent plays a lot because those guys are just so talented. And, you know, again, like last year on our men's team, we had three pros, you know. But on the women's side, it's not like that, you know. So we mm -hmm. have the opportunity to, to create that advantage with our press. Now, um, I do I want to get into this year a little bit, or at least the offseason wise for y'all. Uh, you, you talk about building, you know, the offense out a bit um, from from last year. Well, you add Nia Boyd and Shalexis Aaron uh, as two names. Obviously, there's there's more. There's a lot of freshmen or I'm sorry, not a lot of freshmen, but a lot of transfers, uh, transfer additions. What? How excited are you to, you know, add those two onto a group that returns, you know, Bria Patterson, Brittany Onyeje, uh, Layla Blair? Uh, do you think that's the kind of scoring uh, balance uh, that, that you'll, you're looking for? 
I, it definitely is. And, you know, the one thing about it, the transfer portal has been really good to us. But you're getting players that are proven. Mm -hmm. And you're not trying to figure it out. You can look at the numbers that they've had and the different stops that they've had. And we're not reinventing the wheel. We're putting them in the same kind of like system. Uh, we're taking the strength of Shalexis Aaron, catch and shoot three ball, uh, shot fake, put it on the floor, one dribble. You know, we're not asking her to do things outside of what she can't do. Um, Naya Boy, we're asking her to push tempo, come off of ball screens and make plays. I'm challenging her to be one of the top assist uh, players this year in the country. She's going to get points. You know, we're going to turn people over. She's going to get free layups, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But it's sharing the basketball and commanding the floor. But the most important piece, I think, for us will be Peyton and Jess and those post players that we have down there because um, they'll give us an inside present that we hadn't consistently had since I've been here. I'm um, just so looking forward to that. Now we can throw the ball inside and command that we play us five on five. Sometimes people we've been playing five on four. Um, people just wall up our post players, and, and Tatiana Hill was really exciting, um, but she struggled to score over someone. Um, but those players are, are really exciting to watch, I'm telling you. And, you know, another one that I'm really excited about is uh, Malia Johnson, a transfer from Pitt, you know, mm -hmm. Really showing some great things and shoot the basketball, can guard. She comes from a system like we play. She did it at high school. So after her first month, she was like, Coach, I'm starting to get that old swagger back, you know, <laughs> again for what she did in high school. And now she looked like she's been here a couple of years, just the way she's moving and be able to pick up on things. And so, yeah, we we are unfortunate to have um uh Gia Cook, GG Tori ACL. Um mm -hmm. But she'll be back stronger than ever, uh, which will give her another year of just maturing, seeing the game from a different angle as a point guard. And um, But we're really excited about the transfers and, and especially going into the Big 12 because it's what we had to have. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, going into the Big 12, you know, defense is something you guys can lean on. But, you know, what are you looking to – you mentioned the post play a little bit. What are you looking to add to kind of bring the offense up to now the Big 12 level? Well, we, we're taking a, a chip out of the NBA. We're going to shoot it often and early. You know, so we went back and looked at the last three years. Vaughn Reed on my staff is an incredible um, – he's a head coach and an associate head coach's body. I mean, he's great at analytics. He does all the scouts, and he came back with a report and um, kind of right here of uh, <laughs> what it was like for an offense for us the last four or five years. And he was like, the best years is when we shot it early. So mm -hmm. we're practicing now, you know, from zero to seven seconds, we want to get up a shot. Mm -hmm. um, that next ten, the next seven seconds, we want to get into some flow offense where the ball doesn't stop. That's the other Achilles heel we've had. The ball has always stopped, and we've been losing five to ten seconds running transition, coming back and calling a play, getting people lined mm -hmm. up and all of that. So we're just demolishing that. We're going mm -hmm. fast, transition, this doesn't happen. The ball talks kind of like the Spurs and we let the ball flow and then we've been able to play with that. The great thing about that is you're having five players on the floor that could score. Um, we averaged 89 possessions a game last year. Most of it came from the defensive side because we turned people over and all yeah. that. But we want to try to get to 110, uh, adding the offensive transition, being able to push the basketball. And uh, Brenda Freeze, I call her every year, there's a graphic two years ago. I was watching um, the uh, Brooklyn Nets play, and the guy showed a graphic said there's a college team out there that can go just as fast as the Brooklyn Nets. And I was like, what do you mean? They showed the graphic. There was Brenda was averaging 115 possessions, and the Brooklyn when they're averaging 115 possessions. Yeah. So I took a picture of it, and I called Brenda, and she was like, we just go here, and I just tell them just to get up a shot. Don't turn the ball over. <laughs> I said, it was shit. If it works for her, we're going to try it. That, yeah, that is interesting because you do hear that from coaches. It's like getting a shot up is at times obviously more important because you're not turning the ball over, and especially in situations where maybe the guard play can struggle up and down and whatnot, turnovers will will kill you before missed shots do. Yeah, That's an, it's, that's an interesting um, – aspect of it now you have you know like you said Layla Blair and you know guards that can kind of push the pace a little bit 
um i'm I'm excited to see to see what that what that looks like um how you kind of uh unfold that um have you leaned on any other coaches to like pick their brain about that type of pace type stuff oh man the, the list is long i just okay. talked to mike neighbors you know, at Arkansas, he does yeah. the same thing. I talked to uh, Stan Jones at Florida State, assistant coach. Um, I talked to um, Sue Samurai, yeah, Ar- who I used to work for at Florida State. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been calling everybody just to talk about it. You know, Vaughn and I have been getting on the phone with a lot of different people and just getting up and down and, and grabbing new drills and things like that. And everything is simulated around playing. So we want to be able to play them and not drill them. Um, so that was the other thing that came out of this, uh, especially with talking to Brenda. She was like, we play, we play. And the thing that we did last year and the years before, we always played, but we played through the defensive end. Mm-hmm. So we'll go through our scout, let our practice guys go through it. We'll defend them. We'll get a stop. And I still let the guys take it out. And then we'll play defense with them full court. Now they got to go down. The other. So it was always defensive predicated on the defense. Now we got to flip it a little bit and let the offense go, you know, we defend them, they score, we take it out, and we got to go offensively now. Makes sense. I think, you know, for me at least, um, going into the Big 12, you know, what what, can, what what do you think this kind of could do for somebody like Layla Blair, who in our opinion has been one of the most underrated players in the, in the state, you know, giving her this new platform to kind of show what she can do amongst, you know, some of the best players in the country? And I'm glad you said that because you use a great word there, underrated. <laughs> Because, again, now she get an opportunity to be on the same stage as everybody else, and they will see exactly what Layla Blair is made of and who she is. You know, and I'm excited for her because, again, at the end of the day, I'm going to give you an example. We did a a 20,000-shot challenge this summer, 20,000 made shots. I wanted everybody 20,000 made shots. Mm -hmm. Layla Blair is the only one that completed that. She had 24,000 made shots. Come on. Shooting 500 before workouts, 500s at the end of workouts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, again, now we had some other players that get up to 10, 11, 12,000, that kind of stuff, ranging all the way down, but she's the only one that got there. So, that's the type of commitment that she has to wanting to get there. And so, again, when you put that kind of work in, it's going to pay off. It's going to pay off. You just have to be smart, take care of your body, hydrate, nutrition, those kind of things, pray for no injury, you know, those kind of things. But when you put that kind of work in, the work is going to come back to you. The Lord is not going to let you do that and not repay you. And so I'm looking forward to her on that platform with everybody else. And now they can get a chance to see what we've been seeing, what we saw at South Florida last year, you know, 30 in the first half, you know, like, Mm -hmm. again, (laughs) <laughs> now we we'll have a true point guard so she can be on the wing and be able to opportunities to be able to go and be herself. Uh, the thing that we're asking her to do this year, which I think is going to happen, is people are going to key on her so she's going to have to share the ball a little bit more um, until everybody figure out we have Shalexis and Bria and Naya and all these other people that could score. And now they can't really just key on her. But I think she's going to garner that kind of attention at the beginning. But I'm really excited about her and this platform because, again, she's a tremendous kid. Um, she has another year after this. But I'm being quite honest. I'm telling her, let's go for it. Let's go for it and see can we get you in this draft, on um, this mock draft stuff early and see what happens. And I'm making phone calls to try to do some things like that to get some people down here to see what we have on tap. Because, again, at the end of the day, after they see it, we won't be a, a, a un, unranked uh, uh, under um, – a team that people hadn't seen and, and and they're gonna be wanting to say, okay, I see what Houston has now. Yeah, um it's it's interesting looking through uh your roster. I, I'm earlier I misspoke obviously when I, I said freshman. I you have eleven seniors or graduate seniors <laughs> on this team. Yes. Uh, Ish and I, I I don't know what it when it was, but we were like, man, we gotta find the oldest rosters in, in the in the state. That's what we gotta do this year. It was and, it was uh, last I, year when we were talking to Texas State. That's yeah. right. Last year's Texas State women's team had a, a, a bunch of seniors as well. 11 seniors and grad seniors. What What is that like to coach? Obviously, I assume it makes it easier, but also they're all, you know, 22, 21, 22, 23 up there. They might think they know something. That That's it. You hit it on the head. You hit it on the head. So that, that's the first thing. 
you know, you come in and practice. This is what we did at my old school. And this is how I like, but you're mm -hmm. not there anymore. You're yeah. here, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Well, we ice ball screen. We don't ice here. We go get people. We trapping or we yeah. hedging them, you know, those kind of things. The difference that we do, if we get our ball handler that's coming off a guard, that's really good off a ball screen, we're hedging them hard. We might even trap them. But if we get a dominant post player, we might just quick show and just get back to the post player. So it's different things like that because they think they know all of it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really good to coach them because they have experience and, and it's a lot of things and pressure moments like in practice. When you swing it around and somebody has to make a shot, they've been there before, they've done that. They understand the grind of getting up 6.30, 6 a.m. and doing stuff. They understand taking care of their bodies and all of that. But they also, they want to coach a little bit now. They, they want to tell you, like, uh, you know, they want to have some choices on some things. You know, if they want to make some deals. If we go hard today, <laughs> we have tomorrow off. You know, that oh, kind of man. stuff. So, oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I'm I'm really excited because the group is is really good and they embrace the heart. They embrace the heart and um but it's really really good having you know all that upperclassmen leadership because I told them this is probably a team where we might want to have one player for 30 minutes. Because we're so deep with talent and, and everybody can be able to hold their own. I think it's probably going to be a good 20, 23, 25, 26 minutes at the most for one player. Mm -hmm. Um, the last thing I had, um, how quickly did you kind of embrace uh, the transfer portal and kind of getting transfers? Obviously, that's what I've been thinking for like three, you know, two, three years now at this point. But with the turnover you had this year, I was just curious how quickly a couple years ago, did, maybe or last year or this year, were you like, all right, this is let, let's let's go get some transfers that can help us right now. Yeah, it was. Some, it was some last coaches year. don't. Some coaches don't. You know, don't do it like that. Yep. So, exactly. It was last year. The first mm -hmm. two years, I only wanted to take one or two, and then it was always kids that I recruited and lost in the recruiting battle. We lost Tierra Young to LSU. We lost mm -hmm. Logan to LSU. We lost. Um, uh, who else did we have as a transfer? I can't remember right now, but we always tried to get those kids that I knew already because that's what mm -hmm. I was familiar with. I did. We already had our culture a certain way, so I didn't want to come in and have these new people try to come in and shake up what we have. So that's why I was like, I don't want to mess with this transfer portal stuff. These kids are obviously, you know, leaving programs because they screwed up or blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to feed into it at all. I'm not going to lie mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. And so... Up until last year, I said, started looking around the country and I see all these people getting all these different transformations of what they were doing with their season, some up, some down. But again, I started calling these coaches and educating myself about how were they taking these transfers and what are they doing and how they get them into buying to their culture, especially when they only have one year, you know, some of that kind of stuff. So I was really afraid of some of that and sat down and talked to my staff and everybody did their homework and we collectively came to the table um, and uh, we kind of put a plan together. Here's what we're looking for in the transfers that we have to have. So we started out with points per possession. You know, Shalexis was almost eight and a half points per possession. Yeah, um, Naya was almost nine points per possession. You know, so those things mm -hmm. that we started going, Malia, you know, we started out with points per possession over she's athletic, she can shoot it, she can run, she can jump, you know, that kind of stuff. We started looking at what they did on the offensive end, defensive end. Then we started with our homework on who they are. Um, we had some kids come here on visits that we thought we were getting a really good kid, and we started talking about all the faith that we do in our program. So to give you an example, Layla Blair does a, does a, a Bible study every Thursday on Zoom with our team and put it out on Twitter. Anybody can join in. Well, we pray before a lot of stuff. Um, we bring that in every single day, and some people weren't comfortable with that. So visit was over immediately. So again, it was a whole bunch of things that we started to put in and into taking these transfers. But to answer your question, it was it was just a year ago that I really embraced it and said, all right, we have to make a change now, but we need a plan to be able to go into do to do that. Yeah. That is um always interesting uh to hear, especially with y'all going to the Big 12 now, you know, and adding the players that you put added this year. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to see it, Coach. I think that's all we had uh, for you today. Uh, thanks for joining us, man. This was a lot of fun. 
I'm telling you, man, we have to do it again, man. You know, we got to pick up sometime around December after non-conference is over so we can be able to talk about it. And, you know, probably at the end of the year when we get ready to go into our conference play, we say oh, uh, yeah. conference tournament. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, what, once a month, Coach. Once a month, we'll get you on payroll. <laughs> we'll get you on payroll over here. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> hour or something. I don't know. So, <laughs> so tag it. That's, awesome. That's right, man. Y'all keep going. I'm gonna keep watching, man. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank Thanks, you. Coach. Getting no scouting report. You know it. You know it. Go Cougs, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have.